Tova, and welcome back to Politics in Hawaii with Dennis Esaki on Think Tank Hawaii. Today we'll be speaking with Clayton He, a Hawaiian cowboy, former educator, state senator, and OHA board chairman. He was labeled as a maverick senator, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Senator John McCain was often called a maverick senator also. Clayton also ran for Congress and finished behind Maisie Hirono, but they had ahead of uh, Brian Schatz, who was later appointed to the U.S. Senate by Governor Abercrombie. He was a chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, who confirmed the judges in Hawaii. The judges threw the crooks in jail. Now he is on the parole board. He decides who get released from prison. So it has come full circle. Clayton, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you for joining us today. And tell us why you switch gears from being an educator to a politician. And what were some of your hardest accomplishments in politics? Yeah, thank you, Dennis. Um, well, I, I was living on the island of Molokai as a school teacher uh, in 1980. And by 82, uh, some of the people in the community had urged me to run for the legislature. I was, uh, at the time, uh, working in the community with Alulike and the Department of Education at Kamehameha Schools. And one of the things uh, we were doing at the time was uh, fighting development on the island. It's ironic now, 40 years later, but virtually every island except Molokai does not have to deal it, is dealing with uh, overabundance of visitors. Molokai is exempt in some ways uh, from the overcrowding of caused by the visitor industry. And a lot of that had to do with what we were doing in the 80s, uh, trying to stop more hotels from being built on the west side of uh, the island. So I decided to run for the legislature. I thought maybe working in the legislature might make it easier for the grassroots community of Molokai. Yeah, in fact, uh, in the 90s, I think, there was a foreign entity bought uh, large parts of Molokai, and they hired a lot of the state workers over there. I guess that didn't uh, work out so well. Yeah, um, Kalokoi uh, uh, was always uh, trying to build more hotels under the guise of synergism, bringing more people. But the fact of the matter is um, the island was uh, pretty determined in trying to keep um, the resources uh, abundant for uh, the residents, particularly deer from the mountain and fish from the ocean. And because of the uh, efforts of Organizations like Hui Alaloa, um, the island is fairly sustainable with a population of around 8,000 or so today. Um, you know, you've uh, uh, separated many uh, measures, uh, conservation measures, like uh, was it the land by Turtle Bay? Also? Oh. Yeah, as a, as a member of the legislature, I, I, I focused uh, a fair amount of time on conservation efforts. In 2010, uh, Hawaii became the first state to um, <clears throat> ban the finning of sharks because uh, Hawaii was being used as a, a, a way station for longliners to, that caught sharks, dried the fins, housed, housed them in warehouses at the pier in downtown Honolulu and then shipped them to Hong Kong. So what was happening was uh, sharks were disappearing from the ocean and sharks play a vital role in the health of the ocean. So the Hawaii law became the boilerplate law for other states to follow, which include states like New York, California, Florida, Oregon, Washington, and uh, states like that. Um, uh, I always felt um, that sustaining Hawaii was was very important, and um, 
protecting our natural resources is vitally important for the future generations um, of residents who live here. Yeah, and when I was working in the South Pacific, I saw a lot of these uh, fishing vessels with full of shark fins uh, um, strung up on the lines. Mm -hmm. uh, in Hawaii also, it's uh, uh, considered as aumokua to some people. It's correct. For Hawaiians, uh, the sharks play a, a spiritual role uh, for the families, and sharks are a deity in aumokua. But there were, you know, there was, uh, there were a lot of issues that we dealt with in the legislature that I had a, a hand in. Um, cruelty to animals is now a felony, as it should be. Um, uh, we dealt with uh, other issues uh, in the '80s uh, when I was uh, uh, the mem um, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. The Hawaiian Right to Sue Bill was passed and signed into law by Governor John Waihe'e. That law has, has made it possible for Native Hawaiians to successfully uh, bring uh, lawsuits against the state for breaches of trust against Native Hawaiians, uh, primarily in the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Uh, I worked with alongside uh, Senator Malamo Solomon in the 80s, as well as the 2000s, and Senator uh, Gil Kahele uh, from Kau, and uh, uh, Senator Brickwood Galuteria, among others. So um, we, we tried to focus on issues important to Native Hawaiians. And then more um, towards the uh, later end of my career, in uh, 2013, I believe it was, um, the um, same-sex marriage law became a reality. I authored the law uh, as well as uh, chaired the Committee on Judiciary. And, um, and then in 2014, uh, I authored the law on uh, raising the minimum wage to what it is uh, today, which is 1010, from $7.25 at the time. So. I played a role in some legislation that affects us today. Uh, the legislature needs to continue to update the laws. Uh, for example, the minimum wage law is too low, um, but that's for uh, this generation of lawmakers to deliberate and hopefully uh, make decisions on. Yeah, can you touch upon a little bit on the uh the making of the laws and uh, I know it's not easy and yeah so, sometimes uh, you, sometimes you know you kind of just go by party like they do in congress or... well it's it's been referred to as lawmaking is like sausage making you take you take the bits and pieces here and you try to assemble them and put them together or herding cats or yeah. herding fishes um i think uh uh, a lot of the reason people called me uh, a maverick wasn't so much, uh, at least in my mind, uh, being a maverick as much as it was being independent. And um, I remember in 1984, uh, when I left the House of Representatives and uh, was elected to the Senate, uh, Governor Caetano, who was a member of the Senate at the time, said to me, um, Remember to do all you can while you're here, because when you leave, you'll wish you had done other things um, while you were a member of the legislature. And he, he's absolutely correct. Um, uh, but it was that kind of um, urgency uh, displayed by people like Ben Cayetano and uh, Neil Abercrombie and Duke Kawasaki, uh, Dante Carpenter, uh, that I got my uh, uh, teeth cut uh, by watching them and trying to uh, um, learn from them. And so hopefully, you know, uh, as I kept, uh, as they left and I, I kept, remained in the Senate, uh, I tried to do some of the things that I thought made them successful. I, 
you know, in, um, I think it was 1986, Hawaii passed uh, the tourist tax. And so I was there. And um, I remember, I remember the debates on the floor. But I also remember that uh, that legislature uh, has made it possible to bring more revenue into the state uh, via the visitor industry. And those are the kinds of um, laws I think help um, the state uh, remain economically uh, uh, viable. Quite frankly, if I was there today, I'd raise the tourist tax even higher um, without giving it a second thought. Um, and um, I'd also try to limit the number of tourists that come to Hawaii because 10 million are way too many. Um, when the tourist tax was passed, my recollection was that the two, uh, number of visitors coming to Hawaii at the time was about 6.5 million. And, and uh, the legislature was concerned uh, even then that there were too many tourists uh, visiting Hawaii. The sad reality is that uh, tourists come in larger numbers and spend less per capita um, than they were spending uh, 30 years ago. There were less tourists spending more money per capita. So the, uh, the uh, formula embraced by uh, the Hawaii Tourism Authority and the Hawaii Visitors and Lodging Association uh, is upside down and reasonably, at least as far as I'm concerned, can be uh, um, characterized by uh, greed. And uh, that's unfortunate, in my opinion. I'm sure you had uh, a lot of pressure from some of the organizations you mentioned. Uh, well, you know, the business community, <clears throat> Um, they argued against the, raising the minimum wage. Uh, they argued against um, uh, the tourist tax. Uh, but, you know, I see it as their role. Uh, uh, there's a flip side to, to, to the industry that does not get um, um, uh, talked about. For example, uh, um, I think it was 2010, uh, let's see. Yeah, I think it was 2010 or 2008 or 09. Um, at, the, at the time, Vicky Cayetano, the governor's wife, was the head of the chamber. Uh, and uh, she came to me, I was the chairman of labor and judiciary. And she said the number one issue for the chamber is that the unemployment contribution uh, reserves are too high and it's time to um, um, lower the assessment to employers for the contribution to the unemployment fund because the uh, fund itself uh, through the reserves was much too high. She was right. So that year, the legislature lowered it. Um, uh, lowered the contribution. But these things run in cycles, like the economy runs in cycles. So it needs a needs to either one, be attached uh, to a threshold, or two, the legislature needs a continuous review of um, um, contributions by employers or taxes or on, uh, minimum wage increases the legislature needs to always have a continuing conversation to make the proper adjustments. So the legislature, I guess uh, my point is, um, did things favorable to the chamber and in some cases unfavorable, but that's the nature of um, the legislative process. Yeah. You mentioned you know, Ben Cayetano and uh, some others. Uh, 
I, I think you guys were called the dissidents. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. you, you recall those days? We, we, we were called a lot more than, than yeah. dissidents, but yeah, I think that's a nice, that's a nice <laughs> word, uh, to use for the purposes of, yeah. of today's conversation. Yeah. Uh, you know, Ben and uh, Neil and some of the guys uh, that I was associated with at one time uh, wanted a more transparency uh, in the legislative process, which to me is a fair uh, uh, criticism. And um, uh, oftentimes the media um, um, uh, looks at lawmakers, among others, and, and uh, labels uh, the behavior of the lawmakers. And I'm not sure if the media uh, uh, first coined the phrase dissidents, but I don't think it, my recollection is, I don't think it was the dissidents that said, we're going to call ourselves the dissidents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it really, yeah, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's more, uh, what are you doing to service uh, the, the tax paying public that is most important and how should, one should be judged. Yeah, you're uh, active in uh, Native Hawaiian issues. Um, one of them was uh, with, oh, I think Rice versus Cayetano. Oh, that's true, uh, Dennis. Yeah. yeah, can you talk about that? I was involved, uh, well, for 12 years I served on the, uh, uh, as a member of the Board of Trustees for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Uh, uh, approximately seven of those years I served as its chair. And the Rice v. Cayetano uh, lawsuit was, uh, uh, litigated in the U.S. Supreme Court while I was the chairman at the time. Um, Freddie Rice, uh, who uh, 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 passed away recently, uh, was a friend of mine. I, I knew him from rodeo. Uh, Stand-up guy, straight up. Uh, uh, his his mo'opuna are uh, part Hawaiian. Um, he, he comes from a... Uh, legacy of uh, um, missionary descendants uh, originally from Maui. Um, but he brought a lawsuit, really, at the time, Governor Waihe'e was in office. It was first called uh, Rice v. Waihe'e, then uh, subsequently became Rice v. Cayetano uh, when Cayetano became governor. But it, basically, his, his uh, complaint was, uh, in a sentence, was, uh, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs was a state agency, and therefore, voting was an entitlement to all state citizens registered to vote. And quite frankly, he was right. Uh, OHA was a creature of the state legislature, was signed into law by the governor, and um, is, in point of fact, a state agency. Now, the bigger issue to me where the conversation should move is towards nationhood, a, um, a, a reality uh, that uh, lives in the United States with 750 Native American tribes, like the Cherokee, the Sioux, um, um, the Navajo, the uh, Pequot, uh, and and 740 others. Uh, so nationhood to me is where the conversation should be. And from my perspective, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs was created with that thought in mind. And uh, while I was at OHA, uh, that was where um, I believe that the uh, trustees were um, uh, the end point of the journey was really nationhood for Native Hawaiians. Um, the journey obviously is not complete. And uh, uh, unfortunately for me, I believe uh, we'll uh, uh, live beyond my lifetime anyway. You know, along the lines of 
Rice v. Caetano, there was the Arakaki uh, versus the state of Hawaii on, uh, on who can run for OHA. So now, right. Right. So That's right. any, yeah, any citizen of Hawaii can run, right? I mean, could it be so? They don't have to have a uh, lot quantum or anything. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, but you know, sometimes we forget that, uh, or the message is forgotten that at the time of the overthrow in 1893, and the illegal overthrow uh, as determined by Congress and signed into law by President Clinton, uh, Hawaii uh, uh, was made up of not just Native Hawaiians, but others uh, uh, who came to Hawaii and became citizens of the kingdom. So the idea that, um, or the mistaken impression that the, the kingdom was comprised solely of Native Hawaiians is in fact uh, not correct. Um, uh, as a result of the Rice case and other uh, issues brought before uh, the judiciary, uh, uh, non-Hawaiians, people who are not uh, Native Hawaiian, not only can um, vote for trustees of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, but also can hold office as a member of the board. Uh, I served uh, with uh, Charles Ota from Maui, who was appointed by uh, Ben Caetano. And he, as far as I'm concerned, was one of the best trustees that served, that I served with. Uh, his uh, business acumen and his um, understanding of old Maui uh, was invaluable for us. And so um, I was very privileged and, and proud to have served with uh, Charles Ota, uh, who was uh, a uh, non-Hawaiian who served with distinction uh, as a member of the Office of Foreign Affairs. Yeah, you, you touched a little bit, you know, about uh, Hawaiian uh, issues uh, and, uh, you know, in the Native Hawaiian context. Uh, can you tell us, you know, where, where you see it going? Uh, uh. <laughs> Well, let, let me let me be let me broaden my uh, discussion uh, from Native Hawaiians to yeah. politics in general. Um, I was uh, I was very fortunate to have been ele first elected in 1982. So that you know, we, we're looking really at 40 years ago, and and the lawmakers uh, no, at that time. Uh, were much more independent, they were uh, more bipartisan, but out, they were also outspoken, they were critical, and uh, they were unafraid to take positions. That is not my um, uh, perception of legislators today. Um, let me give you an example. When the Speaker of the House or the Senate President was replaced, it was generally the norm that that former Speaker of the House or the former Senate President would retire. Today, for whatever reason, good or bad, uh, that, that doesn't happen. And it takes on the complexion that people run to serve today just to serve. And uh, if you run just to run, just to be in office, it changes your, in my opinion, respectfully, it changes your um, proclivity to take hard positions, to be heard and to stand up and be heard. Now, there are exceptions in today's legislature. So I don't want to give the impression that it's a broad brush there are some independent legislators, but they're far and few between. And uh, unfortunately, um, the product uh, 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 is emblematic of 
uh, people who run for office to be in office. And that's what we have today. Yeah, and uh, okay, very, very good. <laughs> thanks for that. Thanks for your, that thoughts. Um, okay, what about the Department of Hawaiian Homelands and you know and their mission and uh, where they're going? You know, I I think the Department of Hawaiian Homelands is trying their best. But there were some critical errors made by past directors and governors that has put the Department of Hawaiian Homelands in the financial situation it is today. When Governor Waihe'e uh, and the legislature created the settlement of $600 million, $30 million for 20 years, instead of you taking that, that guarantee and floating a bond worth 600 million, past directors under the governors they represented spent money to build houses with cash on the barrel. Nobody does that. Nobody does that today. We make loans, we refinance our homes to make new homes. Because of that critical error, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands has, has, has a very difficult time uh, to raise financing to build more homes because the $600 million settlement uh, expired um, uh, years ago. And that's the pickle that they're in. At the end of the day, in my opinion, Hawaiian homelands is the land base, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is the financial arm, and nationhood uh, is the umbrella upon which those two agencies should lead Hawaiians into the next millennium. Didn't, didn't the Department of Hawaiian Homelands take some land instead of money also? Well, <laughs> it's difficult for me to uh, uh, describe the actions of the department uh, there, there was a settlement with the state that uh, they acquired some land in lieu of cash. Uh, that, was, that also occurred when I was a member of the Board of Trustees uh, for the Office of Wine Affairs. Uh, but um, uh, the Office of Wine Affairs during my time, uh, I was elected in 19, uh, 1990. The corpus was 19 million at the time when I left in 2002. The corpus was nearly 400 million, largely due to a settlement with what the Wahe administration and lawsuits brought against the state by the Office of Hawaiian Affairs through the Hawaiian Right to Sue bill passed earlier when I was a legislator in my first go around in 86. So, um, you know, the journey, the journey is a long journey, but as Martin Luther King said, the arc should bend towards justice in that journey. And I, that's the, long, that's the um, journey that we're on as Native Hawaiians and as um, residents of Hawaii at this time. Yeah, thanks. We've got uh, so much more to talk about. Uh, uh, I was gonna ask you about some other conservation things. You're talking about OPE sales at one time, but that didn't go through. That ban on yeah, I, uh, Governor Governor Lingo vetoed the bill, yeah. but uh, you know it's the pandemic demonstrated um, that if you leave the ocean alone, its resources will multiply to the extent that they can help feed uh, these islands. That's what the pandemic demonstrated. When less people were out and about, uh, nature uh, showed its uh, amazing ability to reproduce. And the Opihi bill was an effort <clears throat> to slow down the taking of <clears throat> natural resources so that they had a, their natural resources had a chance to regenerate and provide more. It's the antithesis of what we know as greed by people who take 
because it's there and not necessarily because they need it. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Yeah, during this past year, I've, I've been walking on the rocks. I see some pretty good sized ones around. <laughs> um, yeah. So, any, uh, we're getting close to the end of uh, our segment. Any closing statements? Uh, no, not not really. I appreciate that you know you you thought of inviting me to participate with you. Um, you know, I look forward to seeing who else you have on uh, in the future. But uh, it's always a nice time to chat with you, Dennis. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate that very much. Yeah, and I appreciate all you do, and even uh, <laughs> even a small potatoes. I remember bringing my son so he could learn the. Uh, about Hawaiiana from you when he was uh, <laughs> in school. Um, I keep writing and uh, hope to talk to you again later. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank, right. yeah, thank, yeah, thank you all for uh, watching uh, Politics in Hawaii with Dennis Isaki and Clayton He on Think Tech Hawaii. Please share this show with your friends and support Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha, ahui ho, malama pono.